everyone again and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Shira Aroni Makhlouf. I'm a director of business development at the Freemind Group. And today we're going to talk about non-dilutive funding for medical devices. Uh, there will be enough time for Q&As at the end of the presentation today. Um, and uh, someone asked about the if, if they can, if um, you can download the, the presentation, so the, of course you can. Um, you can find, if you look at the bar at the hands out, you can find there a PDF file of the presentation uh, that you will uh, be seeing today. Um, so uh, I guess let's let's start. So first of all, let's start with a short introduction of the Freemind Group. So the, we've been around since 1999, about, well, almost 20 years now. We are 70 full-time employees. We have a diverse client base, so everything from academic universities, universities, academic institutes, and independent research institutes, and industry, everything from small startups all the way up to big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, in a year, we submit over 500 applications a year. Um, and in a nutshell, this is us. We are for now, currently for today, Freemind is, uh, well, again, consulting firm. We are specializing in non-dilutive funding, and actually we are the global leader in non-dilutive funding today. So how do we do it? How do we use non-dilutive funding as a strategic financial tool? First of all, we identify the most relevant funding opportunities out there. And today we're going to speak and talk about some of the sources in the U.S. that are available for you. We strategize to maximize the application's chance of success. Uh, we basically build a strategy for, uh, for a year and uh, try to see how many uh, funding opportunities we can find. We manage complex project or production processes, we lead joint application writing, and support final contract negotiation. Again, we see non-dilutive funding as a strategic financial tool. And actually, we see it uh, we, as we see non-dilutive funding, we know that there is an added value for it. And uh, I'll elaborate on that in a few minutes. So before we dive in, let's speak about, let's talk about the, um, the sources. Basically, the general total pocket of money today is $50 billion annually for 2018. Uh, this pocket of money comes from different sources in the US. Uh, one of them and the largest one is the NIH. And we're going to talk about the NIH later, of course. Other, other organizations such as BARDA, FDA, CDC, Department of Defense, and private foundations such as Michael J. Fox and Bill Gates Foundation. So um, before we talk about the specific opportunities and well, specific for uh, medical devices, uh, I want to share a study from the Milken Institute, which was published um, well, almost six years ago, but it's still relevant for today. Basically, the guys in the Milken Institute, they looked on the long-term effect of raising money from non-dilutive non funding sources. And they found out that in the long term, for every dollar a company received from public investments, and when I say public investments, I mean, of course, government funding, um, such as, well, NIH, DOD, et cetera. So for every dollar they received, they were able to raise $8.38 from the private sector in eight years. And that is because of the validation and recognition or how we like to call it in free mind, the stamp of approval that a company gets once, once these non-dilutive funding sources choose to invest in your company. So as we said, it's an ROI of $2.3, dollars, which is, which is a lot. And another interesting um, fact 
is that historically 50% of all FDA approved drugs received government funding during the course of their R&D. And again, I think it's that's a, a great example uh, of the added value of non-dilutive funding. So it's more than just the financial net value of the dollars. It's more than that, it's the stamp of approval from the government, from the US government and the sources to your science and to your company. So after we share, uh, I shared a bit about the, well, the background of non-dilutive funding and how we treat it. Um, let's talk about the main source of funding in the US and, and it is the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And two weeks ago, we just um, got an announcement that the budget for 2019 would be actually higher. Uh, the Congress had just approved a $2 billion raise. So the budget for 2019 is going to be $39.1 billion. And about $28 billion from it is going for extramural research, which means research um, research project and grants. Um, and part of the opportunities we're going to talk about today are part of the $28 billion available for your company um, and, well, especially if it's medical devices. So again, we're going to talk about medical devices today. But if we're looking at the categorical spending of the NIH for 2018, we can see that, of course, we have clinical research about ten billion, well, ten million dollars invested in clinical research and uh, prevention in neurosciences and infectious diseases and cancer and many, many more indications. So basically, the NIH covers all the indications in the life sciences, all the indications possible, but. Where is medical devices? So that's a great question. So first of all, you should know that in each of these categories, there is money hiding, which is going towards R&D for medical devices. Um, by the way, a couple of more obvious places is, of course, our bio, of course, biotechnology and bioengineering. So there are two categories where most probably a good chunk of the funding is going towards funding medical devices. However, you should remember that each of these categories, and in fact, just about, just about every NIH institute, offer funding for the research and development of medical devices. And having said that, um, probably the NIH institute providing the most funding for medical devices is the NIBAB. Um, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes. So before we dive in and look in some funding opportunities for medical devices, I want to touch upon two important terms that most of you are probably familiar with, but, but for, do, for those who aren't. The first term is IDE. It's investigational device exemption, and it's equivalent for um, IND for drugs, of course, from the FDA. And it allow, uh, allows the investigational device to be used in a clinical study in order to collect safety and effectiveness data. So clinical studies such as, well, pilot and pivotal clinical trials are most, are most often conducted to support a PMA, which is a pre-mark approval, and also known as 510K um, in the US. Only a small percentage of 510K requires actually to, um, to have clinical data to support the application. Um, investigational use also includes clinical evalu evaluation of certain modification or new intended use of legally marketed um, devices. And all clinical evaluation of uh, these devices must have been approved, uh, must have uh, an approved IDE before the study is initiated. So that's the IDE. Um, 510K, uh, of course, it's under the FDA. And the Section 510K requires device manufacturers 
who must register to, to notify FDA of their intent to market a medical device at least 90 days in advance. Um, this is known as, again, uh, pre-mark notification. Um, and uh, basically, you can find uh, the list for the devices that are already existed in the FDA website. Um, and well, I guess that's the most important terms in the medical devices world that you should be familiar with. So, as I said, the first main source is the NIH, the National Institute of Health. And as we saw, as I said, most of, like, ch a big chunk of the money comes from the NIBIB. Um, the NIH is built of 27 institutes, different in institutes, and one of them is the NIBIB, which is the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. And so, what is the NIBIB mission? The mission is to improve health by leading the development and accelerating the application of biomedical technologies, um, integrating the physical and engineering sciences with the life sciences to advance basic research and medical care. Um, so these, these are their missions. So unlike other NIH institutes, the mission of the NIBIB is not limited to a single disease. It's not limited to cancer or neurological disorders or a group of other um, illnesses or diseases. And in fact, the NIBIB is the only NIH institute that actually fund platform technology without the need to specify an organ and an indication or a disease. So if you look at their goals, you can see that um, they are looking to integrate engineering with the physical and life sciences. And they are looking for point of care, wireless and personal health informatics technologies. And they're looking to transform advances, um, to transform advances in disease mechanism into precise medical diagnostic and therapeutics. Just, just to mention a few of their goals, um, so, as you can see, the NIBIB is a great place to start if you are in the medical devices field. And I'll be showing and discussing some of the NIBIB solicitations shortly. So, as you can see here, um, these are the, um, well, basically these are their interests of the NIBIB. So, uh, just a few examples here, MRI, nuclear medicine, tissue engineering, tissue chips, uh, immunoengineering, basically any field in the medical devices world could be applicable here. If it's uh, for diagnostic or therapeutics, it doesn't really matter as long as it's an advanced technology that you can offer. So let's look um, on just the first um, solicitation of the NIBIB. It's the Exploratory or Developmental Bioengineering Research Grant. It's an R21 mechanism. And uh, there is a clinical trial as an optional here. So you can actually offer um, in your application that your next step is going to be a clinical trial, and they will accept that. Actually, that opportunity, this specific opportunity, is for early stage development. So, as you can see, the funding is $275,000 over two years, and basically no more than $200,000 a year. So, as I said, this solicitation is especially for early stage development, and their scope of work is to establish feasibility of technologies, technique, or, or methods that explore a unique multidisciplinary approach, um, high risk, high impact, and develop data that may lead to significant future research. And again, um, clinical trials here are optional, and it's going to be in any field um, in the life sciences, as long as it's technology, as long as it, as it's, um, it fit bioengineering um, interests of the NIBNB. The next due date, dates and deadlines 
our October 16th, which is in, I don't know, two weeks or a week and a half from now. So good luck with that. But if you didn't manage and you can't really do the October 16th, you can always have the next deadline. Um, we know that their standard their deadlines are every October, February, and June. So we know that, well, the next deadline afterwards should be in February 16th. The um, solicitation will be expired by then, by January. So we expect it to be renewed any day now. This is um, another opportunity under the NIBIB. It's the Bioengineering Research Grant. And as you can see here, um, again, clinical trial is optional here if you mention it in the application. And one thing I think I forgot to mention in the last opportunity I presented is that even though it's under the NIBIB, it also participates multiple other uh, institutes in the NIH. So for example, if you have a device for cancer or uh, immunotherapy, if it's, um, if it's for diagnostic or therapeutic, so you can definitely use this solicitation or the last one I, actually, I just showed you. So other institutes in the NIH, such as the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, or NIA, National Institutes for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, um, all of them participate in this application, in this solicitation. Of course, you can go and find this application, um, sorry, this solicitation online and see what are the, um, what are the institutes that, that actually participate in this call. So, um, again, the funding here, since we're talking, this solicitation is actually for more advanced stage let's say um, animal studies and, and even clinical trials, so phase one, for example. So the budget is higher than the R21 and it's not capped. Um, it should of course reflect sc your scope of work, but we know that usually they approve about $500,000 a year for max project period of five years. So it's about $2.5 million in direct cost. You can add on top of that the indirect cost that they can give you. Uh, but again, of course, before submitting the application, we should speak with the program officer, I'm sorry, or you should speak with the program officer to make sure that the budget is okay and what are you looking to, to get from them is also in their scope of work and, and funding. So regarding the scope of work, um, they encourage you to collaborate, collaborate between life and physical sciences, again, since it's NIBAB and it's for um, technolo technologies and, and um, medical devices. And again, apply multidisciplinary bioengineering approach. Um, if you have a, any way to show adoption of promising tools, methods or technique, and um, well, again, the clinical trials are definitely accepted here. The next two deadlines are, uh, well, October 5th, which is in three days. And if not, the solicitation is actually a good for the February 5th deadline next year. So I think you should definitely aim for, for this deadline. Okay, um, now um, let's move on for another um, solicitation under the NIH, um, which is not under the NIBAB. So um, let's talk about the BRAIN Initiative. So the BRAIN Research uh, um, Initiative, which is the BRAIN Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies uh, Initiative is aimed at revolutionizing our understanding, of course, their understanding of the human brain. And they are doing that by accelerating the development and application of innovative technologies. Researcher um, and researcher will be able to actually produce a revolutionary new dynamic picture of the brain. And um, that's their goal. Uh, this opportunity is also multi-institutional. So it's the NIMH. National Institutes for Mental Health, um, National Institutes for uh, NINDS, National Institutes for Neurological Diseases and Stroke, 
And again, the NIBAB is definitely uh, a part of it as well. And this mechanism, um, again, it's for development, development, optimization, and validation of novel tools and technologies for neurosciences, uh, neuroscience research. This solicitation in S is an SBIR, which is um, a special mechanism for small businesses um, in the US. And unfortunately, non-domestic or non-US entities are not eligible to submit and actually to win this um, this award or this grant. So um, US guys, this is for you. The funding here for phase one is actually um, for early stage, of course, up to $225,000 total cost. And for phase two is up to $1.5 million. And uh, well, the maximum project period is two years for phase one and three years for phase two. Again, their scope of work is um, to support the development of novel tools and technologies, of course, through small businesses technology, STTR. Um, STTR, STTR is just another mechanism um, that encourage collaboration between industry and, and, and um, academic institutes. So if you have one, by all means, you can definitely use the STTR mechanism, which is just about the same and also kind of almost the same funding and project period. Um, so I can definitely send it to you if you'd like. Um, and, and that's a great mechanism that we use. You can use um, either phase one or phase two. And the next deadline is actually January 5th. So you are, I think, in a great position to start looking at the solicitation and start preparing toward, towards it. Another great example, but uh, it's not only for U.S. companies. Uh, this is again an R01, uh, another mechanism that we already I already presented, and it's for integration of analysis of brain initiative data. Um, the scope of work and their goal is actually uh, to find um, to develop informatics tools for analyzing, visualizing, and integrating data related to the brain initiative. So everything related to brain, if it's mental health, if it's uh, neurological diseases, everything related to that is, of course, uh, fit this solicitation. The funding here, it's, well, again, it's not capped, but it's recommended, I mean, the, the recommended budget is $5,000 a year with a max project period of five years. Um, this deadline is actually not a standard deadline, so the next due deadline is March 7th, uh, 2019. And uh, unlike the SBIR, again, um, non-US companies are eligible to apply to this solicitation. Another, I think, great opportunity under the NIH is not under the NIBIB, or under the um, uh, NINDS or for neurological diseases. This is actually for cancer. Um, it's a great opportunity for um, medical devices in the cancer and the oncology field. It's academic industrial um, uh, partnership for translation of technologies for diagnostic and treatment. Um, it's an hour one. So again, as the uh, last mechanism I presented, the funding, well, the, the funding is not capped. Uh, it's recommended to the budget. The recommended budget is $5,000 a year for five years, of course. And again, they are looking for collaborations between academic institutes and industry for everything. Again, small startups, big pharmaceutical companies. And uh, in the, of course, oncology field, um, the purpose of, of course, the solicitation is to stimulate efforts to translate scientific discoveries and engineering developments into method, methods or tools that address problems in basic research. Um, again, this is under the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and the next two deadlines are October 5th, <laughs> which is in three days, and February 5th, 2019. Okay, so um, and I just presented, I think, about four or five 
different opportunities under the NIH that you can use if you are in the medical devices field, either if it's um, oncology, if it's under related to oncology or neurological diseases or, or just medical devices in general. Here you can find a short list of funding opportunities for different devices, medical devices, of course, but in different um, indications, different fields in the life sciences. So just for example, the first um, the first solicitation here um, is for and is under the NIMH for mental health. Um, the second one is under the NHLBI, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the NIA, National Institute of Aging. Um, you can find here the third application, the third solicitation, transla um, translational neural. Um, devices is under the NINDS, National Institute for Neurological Diseases and Stroke. Again, there is another one for NCI. Um, NIAD is, uh, well, the fifth application, the fifth solicitation here is for um, allergy and infectious diseases. And, of, and actually, there is another one for, the last one is for orphan diseases. It's under, it's not under the NIH, it's under the FDA. Uh, but, but the NIH participated in that, so that's why it's here. So what I'm trying to say is that basically for medical devices, you can go either the NIBAB, which is more general, and you can submit any applications through it, but you can also find solicitations, specific calls for your medical device under the different institutes in the NIH, if it's oncology, neurological diseases, infectious diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And that's my main, I guess, take home message. You can find any solicitation anywhere. And if you couldn't find one, go through the NIBAB and they will probably be able to fund your um, medical devices, um, R&D, clinical trials, and et cetera. So we talked about the NIH. Um, now I think it's a good time to talk about the review process of the NIH. So after the application is submitted, there will be an external peer review with experts from the project's field. Um, so if it's the NIBAB, it's probably going to be experts from the medical devices world. If it's under the NCI, it's probably going to be experts from the oncology field, et cetera, et cetera. So they're examining the risks and the strengths of the application by measuring five parameters. The first one is, well, whether the project is innovative. Um, does it significate to the science world? Does your project could become a solution for unmet need? Or do you have the right leadership to manage your project? If, for example, the, P ha the PI has the right expertise, and if you have the right environment, the lab space and tool to support your research and science. But most importantly, they examine the, your scientific approach, your scientific aims and goals that you want to achieve. So at the end of the day, great science win awards, but, but it doesn't mean your application should focus only on that. In order to score, to score high in these five parameters, you should also know that how to write your application, how to present your science in the best way there is, and make it as compelling and as attractive as possible. Okay, so let's talk about the NSF, which is another great source of funding. It's the National Science Foundation. So this one is a specific solicit, well, the NSF solicitation, it's an SBIR or STTR, which means again that only US um, entities, US companies are eligible to this solicitation specifically. And this solicitation is um, for engineering, industrial innovation and partnership. It's a phase one, but you can also find the phase two there. And well, um, in terms of funding, the phase one is up to $225,000 for six to 12 months. And phase two is up to $750,000 over two years. And since it's a phase one and phase two, so it's usually for early stage R&D, 
for small businesses. Again, if it's a ST, if it's in an STTR, they really encourage collaboration between universities, academic institutes, and companies um, from the industry, of course. And um, and basically, the R and D should based uh, on innovative. Um, technology with potential of great commercial or social benefits. Um, the selected topics, usually they really encourage and they like to fund medical devices. So advanced materials, um, biological technologies, smart health, biomedical technologies, all of them are relevant to this source, to this um, solicitation specifically. They have um, two deadlines a year. The first one is usually, or the last one, actually, the next one is December 4th, 2018, um, which is in two months from now. But the next deadline would be in June, and they're going to um, reissue and uh, renew the, the, the solicitations toward the, the June deadline. And um, it's important to say that usually the NSF, funds roughly 400 companies every year via this solicitation, SBIR or STTR program, for approximately around 190 million. This solicitation specifically funds about 150 companies with a budget of three million, almost $34 million. And again, please note, only US entities are eligible for this program. Now, we presented the NIH, um, the NSF. Let's talk about another great, great source that I really like personally, which is called BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. So BARDA just, well, received recently a budget of, well, almost $1 billion, more than $1 billion for 2018. And it's approved to develop and procure medical countermeasures that address chemical, biological, and radio radiological and nuclear accidents, um, incidents, and attacks. Um, they have a special focus on pandemic influenza and emerging infectious diseases. Usually, they claim to bridge the infamous valley of death by taking phase one completed projects that have shown, of course, solid preclinical data and have good safety profiles and move them on again in the areas of CBRN, influenza and emerging, and emerging diseases to phase two and phase three. Um, so um, again, BARDA is a great source. It's very specific though to these uh, uh, indications that I mentioned. So if you have a medical device, if you have a medical device in, in this field, uh, you are more than welcome to go ahead and, and uh, talk to them and see if you are um, relevant to 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 their to what to do. So this is the solicitation. Uh, it's a BA. You can see the they have a pretty long name for for the solicitation. So you can definitely go online and check it. Um, the funding again, um, well, well, there is no budget cap, and usually they are extremely high. There is extremely high funding levels available. Um, because usually they found clinical one and 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 up, so they have uh, they are pretty generous, I would say. The the scope of work again, as I said, is SBRN, SBRN pandemic influenza and emerging infectious diseases. There is a rolling deadline, and we're going to talk about the submission process later on. So one special program um, that came out actually pretty recently call, is called DRIVE. Uh, DRIVE, it's a EZBAA. And uh, their funding, well, it's for more, it's for early stage development, especially for medical devices. And um, their time to money is dramatically short in comparison to the standard BARDA awards. The awards can go up to seven, well, almost seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and basically their goal is to, well, the pro the program goal is to protect Americans from natural and international health security threats by soliciting revol revolutionary, uh, revolutionary 
technologies and innovations in health security. Um, of course, the project awarded might be at varying stages of stages of technological uh, readiness. Uh, but again, since the award is well compared to BARDA awards is pretty um, small, I guess it's for more early stage. And recently they announced that they have a special focus on sepsis. So if you have a medical device um, related to sepsis, usually, well, um, um, detecting sepsis, early, early detection of sepsis, that's something that they will really be interested in. So definitely you should take that, um, bear that in mind. The deadline is again rolling, and we're going to talk about the submission deadlines. Uh, the, sorry, the submission process in a few minutes. And one last thing that is really maybe important to mention. Um, basically, um, the if, if you really want to hear more about this project and this program specifically, the DRIVE pro, uh, program, you are more than welcome to, um, to join our um, non-dilutive funding summit in January. Um, it's gonna be on January 9th and Mr. Tyler G. Merclery will be, will be there and will give a presentation on how they are building novel public-private partnership with non-dilutive funding to foster disruptive innovation to enhance national health security. Um, so you are definitely welcome and uh, I can sh send you a link to, to register to our non-dilutive funding summit in January. It's gonna be in San Francisco um, via email uh, in a couple of days. Another great source is, uh, of course, under the Department of Defense, is the U.S. Army, the United States Army Medical Research and Material Command. Again, um, again, here the budget is not capped, and you must justify your requested budget um, on the application. And um, well, they have broad, broad. Um, well, a lot of interest interest in, in a broad scope. Basically, um, they aim to provide solution to medical problems uh, of the American soldiers. Um, so they are interested in, in funding, well, military infectious diseases, combat casualty care, um, well, anything related to medical, chemical defense, medical stimul uh, simulation, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have a medical device that you think should, that could be relevant to the U.S. Army and they can take care of, well, they can actually use it, you are more than welcome to see and look at the um, U.S. Army BAA and see, uh, and maybe contact them and see if you are relevant to what they are looking to fund. Another great source is DARPA. It's Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Again, as the US Army, as BARDA, there is no budget cap. You must justify your requested budget. And they, they um, aim to leverage biology as a technology to solve interactable problems. They actually, um, they actually look to, to solve problems um, and for national security. Um, so everything including human machine interference, human performance, infectious diseases, and synthetic biology. And their goal is to develop and demonstrate uh, biologically based technology as a part of the national security um, toolkit. So if you have something related to protecting the national, well, and, and protecting the, U the U.S. Uh, citizens, you are more than welcome to contact DARPA and see if you are relevant to, to this source of funding. And again, the deadline here is rolling. So we just mentioned, well, the U.S. Army, DARPA, and BARDA, the, the DRIVE program and the general solicitation and they have a specific submission process. You start with a white paper, also called as a pre-application. 
Usually it's limited to about five to 10 pages long application. And in this application, the short application, you describe in general your scientific aims and goals and what are you looking to fund. And if they are interested, you are invited to submit the full application. Um, so basically, a lot of applications do not progress beyond the white paper, beyond the pre-application stage. So if you are called to submit a full application, your like, likelihood to success is actually it, it improves dramatically. So actually, after that, carefully craft your white paper, ensuring your science is well presented and meets, of course, the guidelines and the specific, specification of the solicitation. After that, we, you have a technical review and you are invited uh, to, to do the cost proposal negotiation. And after that, um, well, hopefully you are, you could be awarded. So we strongly recommend to turn non-diluted funding, and that's for summary, of course. It, we strongly recommend to turn non-diluted funding into a strategic source of funding. Um, usually our clients invest about 5% of their fundraising effort in securing non-diluted funding in order to maximize the company's funding potential. Um, more than the non-diluted funding money, it's added value that could be translated into additional private investments or even exit in the near future is there. So um, you should definitely use non-diluted funding among other sources that other uh, funding sources um, such as angels and public markets and VCs. And how are you going to do, how are you going to do it? First of all, you should try to maximize your chances for award by lower the risk of your application. And how do you do that? First of all, once you submit and write an application, you need to know your weaknesses. If there are any gaps in your capabilities or expertise, you can always use an external assistance or collaborator. So um, of course, find the right, the right partner if necessary. Know the interest of the agency or the mechanism. I strongly recommend you to go ahead and speak with program officers, even, even if, if it's from the NIH, if it's from BARDA or the US Army, go and speak with them, see what they're looking actually to find and see if your project could really fit their interest. And after that, of course, address the non-important administrative aspect. Uh, you don't want to go ahead and start working on application and then find out in the last minute that you're, since you are, I don't know if it's an SBIR and you're not even eligible to submit it. So of course, address all the administrative aspects and establish yourself both, both as a top researcher, as well as an experienced manager in your application, of course. And how do we do that? Um, are the Freemind group. So we have three things that we do. First of all, in order, of course, to maximize your funding potential. First of all, we start by identifying all relevant funding opportunities for your project. So if, for example, I presented today, today the NIH and DOD and the, the, well, under the DOD, the US Army, DARPA or BARDA, we try to identify all the relevant opportunities. We go ahead and speak with program officers to make sure that your project could fit their interest and actually have the potential to win um, an award. And uh, based on that, we create a multi-submission granting strategy uh, based, of course, of course, on all the information that you can share with us and uh, the opportunities that we find for you. And the last thing that we do, and I think it's the most important one, we submit as many top quality applications as possible. That's all for today. Um, thank you so much for attending uh, the webinar. I hope it was helpful and useful, and I hope you learned some new stuff here today. Um, now I think it's a good time for Q and A's. So let's see what we've got.
Okay, so I don't know if, I don't think there is a specific question that I can share with you all today. Um, again, if you want the presentation and the, well, with all the opportunities that I presented today, you can find it under, well, at the uh, go to webinar bar under handouts. Uh, you can find there the PDF. And um, that's, it, that's it for today. Thank you so much. The presentation and the video will be available at our website on our um, YouTube channel very soon. Um, and again, thank you all for joining and I hope to see you at our next webinar in a month from now. So thank you so much and have a great day.